There's something magical about the movies that I just love. Being transported to another world, another life. For me, it was a way to combine all my interests, music, visuals, and storytelling. Roger Ebert said that a motion picture is an empathy-generating machine. It is the culmination of thousands of years of artists and artistry coming together to tell a single story. There's really, really nothing like it. And as a medium, it's really powerful. It has the ability to leave us feeling hopeful or despairing about the world. It also has the ability to shape society. They were the art form of the 20th century. They were the way we saw the world. The Hollywood, they made a lot of very pro-American movies. And in fact, Hollywood invented America to the world in the old days. But for some, that power isn't used for good. Marvel's Doctor Strange accused of whitewashing to appease China. In the original book, the zombie virus originates with a poor peasant boy in the rural countryside of China. It spreads through a black market organ trade. This whole plot line was surgically removed from the final script of the movie. The new Barbie movie featuring a map of the South China Sea that shows China's ownership of disputed Th this islands. This is really designed for the eyes of the Chinese censors and they're trying to kiss up to the Chinese Communist Party. I believe that most of us a large majority of us got involved with China because of the opportunities and the fact that those opportunities also had a bigger calling, which was creating sort of this dynamic between the U.S. and China that was going to allow us to spread the aspirational quality of democracy into a communist country, maybe someday changing them over to a democracy like ours. But over time, all of us have been punched in the nose. How far back does this go? When did this Hollywood-China relationship start? Why did it start? Is it really just about money? Are there other parts at stake? All acts of genocide seek to remove from a community their stories. The very first thing. It's been more than a decade. We have not had a major studio put a movie into production with China as the villain. Because it's so scary that they're able to pressure people to, to change their behavior from afar without yeah. no bullets. This is just money. money. It's incredible to me to watch the power that they have. They don't do this, of course, through direct control. They do it through their enormous economic leverage and the fear from studios on missing out on a market of 1.4 billion people. What's at stake? The soul of the nation is at stake. Therefore, everything. The nice thing about living here, as you can see, is you're right by the all-important airport. So if you're doing business in China, that always comes in handy. So I spend a lot of time on planes. It's nice when you're pretty close by. That's the shipping lane. So like up in my house, you can see the ships coming in from Shanghai's port, Hong Kong, and they, they all, all come, come through this way and you can see them all go across. How did you get started with Hollywood especially? It was just dumb luck. I, uh, when I graduated school, the economy was not very good. And I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I read a book called Blue Highways that was written by a Pulitzer Prize winning author, a guy named William Lee Seat Moon. And he talked about how he got in a van and just traveled across the country and, and he visited different towns and cities and figured out what the heartbeat of America was. And I just thought that would, sounded super cool. That was like my Jack Kerouac type of <laughs> like idea of, okay, well, I'm going to do that and find a place to settle down. And then eventually, you know, somebody convinced me to come out to L.A. to visit and I never left. Wow. And then next thing I know, I hear about the Hollywood business, and it was called the Wall Street of the 90s back then. I 
was like, wow, there's a lot of great opportunity. It sounded like whoever wanted to work the hardest could rise up. You know, it was very hard to get that entry-level job. A lot of that stuff was sort of given to the nephews of Steven Spielberg right. or whatever. But if you could get one of those, get that foot in the door, you know, the world was your oyster if you were willing to work hard for it. For me, I had no problem with working hard. I got a job as a temp at William Morris Agency, which is now Endeavor. Got promoted very quickly out of that and spent almost a decade there. And that's where I came across China for the first time. China's rise has been something of a miracle. It is quite simply the most successful case of economic development in human history. I didn't go to China for the first time until the early 2000s. And when I went over there, they had a joke that the national bird of China was the crane. When you get there and you throw on a hard hat pretty much everywhere you are, you realize the construction crane is everywhere you look in Beijing and Shanghai. When you see something like that, it was hard to sort of turn away from it as an opportunity. It looked really interesting to me. After the Olympics ended, the Chinese government said, we want to build a film industry. And they looked at various entities around the country and wondered who's going to help lead that crusade. And we raised our hand and we dove right into it. So it sounds like you're a messenger role, almost like a diplomat. Did you see yourself kind of in that role? Well, definitely a fixer, definitely a diplomat. This is what the Chinese government needs. I know that's too much for you, Hollywood. So let's figure out how we can get what their agenda is and make it work into the best sort of version of what this movie can be. Chinese bottles. If people have seen the movie Looper, it stars Bruce Willis, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Emily Blunt, and then we also had a Chinese actress named Summer Cheng in it. They use specialized assassins like me, called Loopers. One of the things that's very difficult about a movie like that in China is that China does not allow time travel in the film. And the reason they don't like time travel in the movie is because you're telling a story about something that happened in the past and something that is happening in the future. And the Chinese government wants to control the way the past is portrayed. And the same thing for the future. They want to dictate where China's going and they want to dictate what China's going to be viewed at as in the future. So any sort of time travel film, they don't like. The underlying thematic of the movie as you're watching Joseph Gordon-Levitt in the present day, you know that at some point he wants to retire and he wants to move to his idea of utopia. You're me. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, when he becomes Bruce Willis in the original script, wanted to live in France. He wanted to marry not Summer Ching, but a French woman. So we had to think, okay, if we want to get this band type of concept into China, what do we do to brand integrate China's narrative, the narrative that the Chinese government wants in the film in order to get access to that huge market. So what we decided was we were going to essentially influence the filmmakers to change the future in the movie from France to China. We know that you've been stashing so one of the things that we came up with during that was this funny exchange that would occur between a mobster that comes back into the present day, played by Jeff Daniels, and Joseph Gordon-Levitt. And in that scene, Joseph Gordon-Levitt is being asked by Jeff Daniels, where do you want to live? What do you want to do when you retire? I'm going to France. You should go to China. I'm going to France. I'm from the future. You should go to China. I'm going to France. From the future, you want to move to China. When we tested it in front of an audience, they went crazy for that one line. And that line also had the Chinese government applauding. So we, we nailed both ends of that. We were on the cover of the New York Times, cover of the Wall Street Journal. This idea of creating a business out of 
Hollywood and getting access to that market was obviously what got us into it. But what it led to was something much bigger than that. This show, China in Focus, started around the same time the virus broke out, and it's where we break stories of firsthand information from China. I think because we were the only show that was talking about it, no one in America was really talking about it until there were starting to be like one or two cases in the U.S. Then suddenly, you know, all the mainstream legacy media were talking about it too. But because people were reading about something happening and they wanted information, they found our show. Called China and Focus. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm your host Tiffany Meyer. Questions are now being raised about how information about the coronavirus. Because we do have an underground network in China, right? That's able to give get us firsthand information. So we were able to break a lot of the news, and so we were getting a lot, a lot, a lot of views. Back then, we would get one or two million views per episode, so like per day. With the whole pandemic, right? You you started having all sectors of society, whether that's Government, or just even say the average person on the street, start to realize like, okay, why is it suddenly like this virus that seems to come out of Wuhan, especially? Why is this impacting me? How did it even get here? Right. So suddenly, like China was much more on the map for many more people. The most consequential strategic competitor for the coming decades, and the most serious challenge to U.S. national security. That's according to the Pentagon's new national defense strategy. You know, with the pandemic, that suddenly this whole issue was really brought to light, and it was like, just how deep does the infiltration go? How many sectors? Is it just the government, or is it like everything? And that's when we saw the news about Top Gun. The Taiwanese and the Japanese flag had been removed from Maverick's jacket, and there's a very clear reason why. That's a big no-no for Chinese censors. And that's what's so shocking about all of this, right? That an American icon would need to try and placate the Chinese regime. And that's not all. There seems to be more questions than answers at this point. What does it mean when such an influential cultural institution is taking its cues from the Chinese regime, which doesn't have our best interests in mind? How far back does this go, right? It's like. When did this Hollywood-China relationship start? Why did it start? Is it really just about money? Are there other parts at stake? Is it about cultural exchange? What really were the decisions that started this whole partnership? DMG is celebrating its 19th year in, in operation. I've been working with the company since 1999.、Uh, we're the number one media buyer in China. We're constantly growing, so I will throw out there that、um, we are consistently looking for MBAs that graduate with Mandarin language speaking skills. So, if anybody wants to shoot me their resume, feel free.、Uh, we can't hire fast enough. Well, it's interesting because、um, as we were starting that process, Joe Biden, who was the vice president at the time, sat down with Xi Jinping. They created a new movie sort of structure of how、um, Hollywood was going to get access to that market. They actually raised the amount of movies from 20 to I think it was 32, and then on top of it, they raised the amount of box office that the studios get from China from 13.7 percent to 25 percent. These two future leaders of the two superpowers take such a vested interest in Hollywood. Before we got involved with Marvel, their largest hit was Iron Man 2 at the time, that made 20 million dollars in the box office. When we made Iron Man 3 and got it into that box office a few years later, Iron Man 3 made 20 million dollars just in its opening day, and it went on to make 125 million in that market. 
If you look to the last film that Marvel got in, which was the latest Avengers movie in, I believe, 2018, that film made $750 million just in the China market. So if you look at that crescendo, that exponential raise of where revenues and profits were going, everybody knew that that's what it was going to be someday. So if you could get access to the market early and continue to grow upon that, the world was limitless when it came to that market, and that's what everybody was chasing. Something started in about 1994. The CCP allowed 10 films a year in. Hollywood didn't pay attention. But in 1996, Titanic was released, and it made almost $70 million. This caught Hollywood's attention. Titanic, I think, also caught the CCP's attention. And that really was the birth of that relationship. If we look at Jiang Zemin, with him it's quite interesting because he saw Titanic and he was extremely impressed with it because it's very emotional. And he was just blown away by the power that has. And so he required the party's most powerful members, the seven members of the Politburo, he required them to watch the film. And he told them, we should never think that we are the only ones who know how to work on people's ideology. And so he really recognized the impact that emotion can have on people's ideology and thinking. Chinese influence was playing into what we see in U.S. films. It's not a one-off, it's not an occasional thing, it happens a lot. The influence started in 1997 with Red Corner, Kundun, and Seven Years in Tibet. The Red Corner is a 1997 film that Richard Gere starred in, and he plays a character, an entertainment lawyer called Jack Moore. And his job is to go to Beijing and try and broker this satellite deal. And while he's there, he gets basically framed and suspected of committing a murder. And so he gets a state-appointed lawyer who tells him you should just plead guilty or else you could basically be executed. And unlike in your country, Mr. Moore, sentences are carried out within a week. You will be shot and the cost of the bullet will be billed to your family. China's Ministry of Radio, Film and Television, which is one of the government apparatuses, was telling them, you know, no cooperation between any of the studios that were behind this movie. China didn't want to work with them. It's a lot of money involved, just cut them off. So that also really impacted Richard Gere's career in Hollywood. Scorsese had this, this film in um, the mid-90s. It was on um, the Dalai Lama. Back to lead us. And they basically shelved the film. It was a Scorsese film, and the studio basically tripped it and pushed it in the corner and tried to pretend it never happened. Religion is poison. We accept no conditions from the Chinese. You can't even watch it on DirecTV. You can't download it. It's not on Netflix. It's not Amazon. They tried to do the same thing with Seven Years in Tibet. Seven Years in Tibet is actually based on a true story about the young Dalai Lama. May they be joyfully reunited with their relatives. This was when he's super young. It's a story about him and an Austrian mountaineer back in the day. So a French director heard this story and was like, wow, it's incredible. I want to make a movie out of it. And so he did. And it starred Brad Pitt and all this. And so this also came out in 1997. But after it came out, the Chinese Communist Party was really unhappy with it. They're like, you know, you made our military officers look really brutal and you portrayed the Dalai Lama in too much of a positive light because the Chinese Communist Party had taken over Tibet in the 1950s. So they're quite sensitive about how that's portrayed. So they banned basically everyone involved. Sony Studios wasn't allowed to operate in China for decades. And Brad Pitt, who was also quite young at the time in that movie, wasn't allowed back into China till 2014 and 2016. So that's like how long the repercussions were just for, you know, trying to do something that was based on a true story. It's striking to me and you have to ask yourself why. And you know why. It's the uh, long shadow of the CCP. And that was the shot heard around the world, which was, Hollywood, you can't just make the stories that you want to make and tell them on the big screen without thinking about China first. 
That was a warning to all other studios in the West, being like, if you do something we don't like, you're going to have to suffer the consequences. There was a scene in Mission Impossible 3, the Tom Cruise movie, where he's running through Shanghai. And just like a regular scene, Tom Cruise runs a lot, that's what he does in movies. But they said that he was running past neighborhoods where there were clothes on the clotheslines outside, which you think of as maybe a, a lower middle class, maybe they don't have, you know, clothes dryers, that kind of a thing. What the hell are you doing in Shanghai? And they wanted to remove that because it would be seen as a sign of weakness that the Shanghai neighborhood didn't have the, the economic strength to have people who needed that kind of a, a close drying situation. So it was removed. And again, this is a very, very minor point, but that's how specific the Hollywood industry was when it came to placating Chinese audiences. Another example is, of course, the biggest one. They made a remake of Red Dawn, which was the 1980s hit. It was about a, an invading force led by the Soviet Union. It was very, you know, timely because of the Cold War going on. But they remade it, but they made China as the invading force. And between the time they originated that and thought of that, to the time it was getting closer to release, they thought, oh my gosh, the Chinese marketplace is blowing up. We can't have China as the villain. So what they did was they changed it. They digitally changed the Chinese uniforms, the flags, anything that represented China became North Korea, which was a more palatable enemy. And then this relationship became really perverse with the live action remake of Mulan, which made the Uyghur really the villains. So you have CCP propaganda in partnership with Disney what could be so more American than Walt Disney, apple pie, and baseball? And now it's being co-opted by the Chinese Communist Party. And, and you can see that through the credits in thanking basically the CCP. When you're saying all these different entities, you're thanking the CCP. Our culture, our way of life is being censored by the Chinese Communist Party. Our major industry is self-censoring their scripts and outright kowtowing to the Chinese regime because they want to make money in China. I have a film that I've been shopping uh, that's about to get produced. Hopefully I'm going to be directing this year. So I was uh, pitching the movie right before COVID happened to a company who was very interested in the script. And we're just sitting around talking about, you know, could we get Mel Gibson for this? Could we get Jeff Bridges for this? How would that work? Is that enough box office? Whatever. And then right at the end of the conversation, the two men that I was talking to, they, they said, well, you know, we get a lot of our money out of China. Is there any way you could make this movie a little bit more attractive to the Chinese? And I was like, well, I don't know. What, what would that look like? How could I make it more attractive to the Chinese? He said, well, it's, a, it's all about terrorists uh, in, infiltrating the border. Is there any way we could make the uh, terrorists Japanese? Because the Chinese really hate the Japanese. I started laughing. I thought he was kidding I, because this was just like, this is a joke, right? But no, they were totally serious. And I was, so we thought about it for a second, but it was like, this is insane. No, I can't make the terrorist Japanese. So that, that kind of deal sort of fell apart. It's just known in the industry, it's kind of like a silent rule, that if you say something against the regime, you will lose the opportunity to get your film into China for distribution and you will lose the opportunity to get certain grants. Government grants will not support. A lot of independent funders will not support because they have business dealings with China. The CCP has such a strong hold over the entertainment industry. And what's the fallout of all of that on our society and culture? Well, the fallout on this is what happens with the perception that people have. That people look at this as being normalized and that they accept what China is saying. How often do you see a story where China is the bad guy? You, you don't. Our media environment has caused our 
just the whole perception of China, the reality to be distorted. People have been brainwashed, I mean, without knowing it. How did Hollywood get so involved? Because it seems in many other countries they see Hollywood as the bastions of American democracy. How did Hollywood as an institution get so infiltrated? Money. <laughs> Money. China bought its way into Hollywood. Uh, it, it's not... Things don't just happen by accident. Especially when you're talking about an ideology that's so insidious. They said, oh, Hollywood, listen, if you want to produce that movie, that's fine. But if you want to bring it to China, which is, you know, a multi-billion dollar proposition, then you will abide by our rules. China owns pretty much most of the movie theater chains now here in America. And China said, you can't have that in there. And Hollywood listened and they paid attention. The whole thing about China, the huge market that's there, and the influence that they have, they bend over backwards to appease them. They're buying up not just America, they're buying up the world right now. So let's talk about how that played out in terms of Iron Man 3 then, because it's like, you know, a superhero movie, Marvel, there's a lot banking on it, you know, people look up to these characters. How was the China elements added in? We got involved with Marvel because Marvel had not been able to get into that market in a big way. They came to us and said, hey, if you can figure out how to apply what you did with Looper at a $35 million budget, sure, sure. what could you do with a $200 million budget movie called Iron Man 3? And if you could do it, we want to do it because that is how we're going to get access to the market in a big way, in a bigger way than just the movie itself. We'll get access for our consumer products, we'll set up theme park rides and all that other kind of stuff. So that's how it came together. So Marvel is very secretive about any of their scripts. So we had to go to Marvel Studios and actually read the script in a 90 minute period. And during that, take notes and figure out, okay, well, if there's this going on, when, where could we put some China stuff? And we would come up with a bunch of sort of haphazard ideas. And that's where this character Yinsen comes into play with a Chinese scientist named Dr. Wu. I'd like to introduce you to our guest, Dr. Wu. Oh, this guy. Mr. Stock. Hey. Yeehaw. For China, they love technology and they love medicine, they love healthcare, they love being the innovators and the world leaders of it. So we knew there was a real opportunity to introduce a character into the Marvel Universe that's Chinese, but it's an essential part of the story. It's part of the story that allows the main character to survive and the main character to live on past Iron Man 3. And that character is Dr. Wu. Dr. Wu is gonna be advanced beyond any doctor, any technology, biological engineering type of person with discipline anywhere in the world. And that's how we got that narrative passed by the Chinese government because they were like, bumping their chest, they're like, oh, this movie is gonna be shot partially in China. It's gonna have a Chinese actor, but on top of it, it's gonna showcase our technology advancement as a country overall. When we were shooting Iron Man 3, it was December, it was probably 20 degrees, it was cold, it was drizzling. As one of my colleagues said, it felt like we were shooting Gorky Park in Beijing. You know, when you're going through that, it's like a battle-tested relationship. The way they, they look at what we're creating as far as culture is concerned and seeing how it touches them emotionally and how they want it to touch consumers emotionally. So, in a way, you sort of feel this camaraderie that occurs where it's like, hey, we're in the trenches together and we're both trying to achieve the same common goal. The center of the universe in the eyes of the Chinese government, it's Beijing. And then if you think about how Beijing is constructed, you have the ring roads, right? You have the fifth ring, the fourth ring, the third ring, the second ring. Well, the first ring road is what? It's around the Forbidden City. That is the center, that's the heart 
of not only Beijing, but the heart of China. So we wanted to have the premiere there. We had to create all this hype and publicity around him, and then on top of it, for the show that we did, that was televised, we had to actually create a show that was almost like a variety show around Robert Downey Jr. And to get the eyeballs watching him, we had to cast that show with all the biggest actors in China. Robert Downey Jr., he was the first movie star to really come over there and promote a film. And, and he was always intrigued by the East anyway. He's always been a studier of martial arts. You really want people to feel like this is a goal of yours, is to come over and really understand China and be a part of it. So he came over and we scripted pretty much everything that he said at least on the onset of when he talked about like, you know, China, I'm here, I want to be here. I've always loved this culture. I've always loved the people. Um, I love the system of government you're under. This is where I want to be. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so proud to be here, that kind of stuff. People who know me back in America know that I'm very, uh, I'm very interested in, in all things, uh, all things Chinese. I, I live a fairly Chinese life in America. Well, Robert Downey Jr. is a, a professional in every way, so he knew the, the game that had to be played. He even ate, um, I'm forgetting the name of those like terribly bitter uh, uh, fruit with the sauce on it, like the big stick that he ate. He would do all kinds of different stuff that culturally was relevant to, to China. He would say everything that we would want him to say. He would shake the hands of every Chinese government official that was there. By the way, we had Chinese government officials on all our sets too that were, you know, overseeing what was going on. It was a pretty intense situation because there was so much of a microscope put on this movie, like these two superpowers getting together to make the biggest movie of the year for Hollywood. It was, uh, there was actually almost too much attention put on it. And every step of the way, we just sat there going, God, I hope we don't fail at this. I guess that's like the editing process too, you cut out so much right. stuff. The audience only sees what you want them to see. It's a lot of power. It is, it is. It's a very powerful medium. And I think more filmmakers need to be taught that in schools, the power that they, that they wield. Myself entering the industry as a small independent filmmaker, I had friends in Hollywood who said, don't do it. This will kill your career. You won't get funding. You won't get the top producers that you need to work with. You will have many people say they won't work with you because um, you've said something to offend the Chinese regime. They didn't realise I was going to go to the extent that I was going to of absolutely sort of blowing up these stories. But they're afraid of even mentioning one line that could offend the Chinese regime and being cancelled. The first long form movie documentary that I made was hard to believe and it was about the killing of prisoners of conscience for the sale of their organs in China. This huge population, extremely vulnerable, family didn't know where they were, jailers didn't know who they were, and they became this just vast uh, sea of uh, expendable humanity. It's an absolutely horrific crime. I cannot think of really much a worse crime than that. 
at the time, this was 2015, I just thought, this isn't being covered. What more important topic could there be? We've had pushback at every step of the way of distribution. It's been extremely difficult uh, for every movie. I've had colleges call me and cancel screenings, and they've actually said on the phone, uh, one even in writing said, I'm sorry, we have to cancel this screening because we have too many students from China on our campus, and we are worried that we will lose funding from China. They say China, but really, it means they're losing funding from the Chinese Communist Party. For every college that told me the truth about why they canceled our movie screening, I believe there was probably 10 more that didn't tell me the truth. Black Adam that just came out of theaters mm -hmm. now can't play in China just because of one line that mentions Dalai Lama, right? So given that just like one line that appears in movies, what is China so mm -hmm. afraid of? Well, that's a million dollar question. I mean, you've got a, a powerful nation. Their place on the world stage goes without saying. Why would you be afraid of this one little line, this one little moment? Uh, it's very interesting. It just shows you the level of control that the Chinese officials have on pop culture. They clearly think it matters, and to some extent they're right. We had a huge disagreement with the studio here in the U.S. and what the Chinese government wanted, which was Summer Ching in prominence in that poster around the world. Why? Because. China was not just emphasizing this idea that they wanted to portray a certain narrative to their 1.4 billion people. They wanted that narrative portrayed to the rest of the world. And that's where a lot of the problems lie with all this stuff, which is their censorship is not just about their own market. Their censorship and their push for propaganda goes beyond their borders. They looked at, well, it's, it's kind of hard to get American culture and population under your thumb and influence. Uh, but if we just capture a few elites in a few areas, if they can force Hollywood to self-censor, then it'll affect the entertainment industry across the United States and around the world in ways that China never otherwise would be able to get away with. As the people at the top, who have said, we want distribution access to China. But the CCP is saying, we want indoctrination access to America. And that's, that's the payout. They could basically take over America without firing a shot because they control access to our minds. They have this ability now to decide what we get to see and not see, so they can promote what makes sense to, to them and uh, potentially pro, you know, sway elections uh, just through that mechanism. When you were working on productions in China, did you ever think about the human rights abuses happening there? Or was that, as China likes to say, their internal problems and didn't cross your mind? Did you ever have to wrestle with that? That's a great question. Um, I never thought of human rights issues in China before my punch in the nose. Never did. I mean, I saw, I saw things with, um, you know, the village I was a part of that I felt was something that wasn't um, right in the U.S. I mean, I remember even at our, at, our, at our company, you know, people that were working way too long of hours, way too hard, probably weren't compensated well and were sleeping in stairwells. I think that was uh, stuff that I just sort of brushed aside as just like, oh, well, that's a different culture, that's the way it works. I believe that most of us um, a large majority of us got involved with China because of the opportunities like we talked about and the fact that those opportunities also had a bigger calling which was creating sort of this dynamic between the U.S. and China that was going to allow us to um, spread the aspirational quality of democracy into a communist country, maybe someday changing them over to a democracy like ours. Um, but over time, all of us have been punched in the nose. Now, when it comes to understanding human rights in China, there's probably no better person than Chen Guangchen. A blind activist in China makes a daring escape. 
Chen Guangchong, a self-taught lawyer and advocate for the poor, had been a prisoner in his own home for more than 18 months. During that time, he and his wife were periodically and savagely beaten by their Chinese guards. Diplomatic standoff between the United States and China is finally coming to an end. At the center of it is the Chinese human rights dissident Chen Guangqing. He escaped from house arrest two weeks ago, was rescued by U.S. diplomats. When we got the word that he was in Beijing wanting to talk to us uh, in the wee hours of the morning, we went out and contacted him. And then we uh, engineered almost a, a maneuver out of Mission Impossible to bring him in uh, to the embassy. What's interesting is that he had his own unique experience with the Hollywood industry that was making headlines while he was still under house arrest inside China. Handuanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduanduandu
For example, if we go to Mao Zedong in 1942, he held a secret speech for his own comrades. And he tells them there is, in fact, no such thing as art for art's sake. Instead, literature and art are subordinate to politics. And then he goes on to say, Our aim is to ensure that revolutionary literature and art follow the correct path of development and provide better help to other revolutionary work in facilitating the overthrow of our national enemy. Now, if we look at the next leader, Deng Xiaoping, he also said something similar. He said literary and artistic workers should cooperate with each other to wage a long-term and effective struggle in the ideological field against all kinds of ideological habits that are harmful to the four modernizations. So to sum up, the Chinese Communist Party really sees art as a tool to further the state or party's goals. And to do that, it needs to be an effective tool. Next, we have Hu Jintao. So he really hammered the point home that art needs to enhance the state's cultural soft power. So now he brings in this term soft power. What that means is he says it needs to absorb and borrow all outstanding cultural achievements from other countries, so say America, but to use that for their own benefit. So this is not them telling the world what they are, but other countries telling each other what China is in the way that the CCP wants it to be shown. Now, if we look at the current CCP leader, Xi Jinping, he takes it a step further, even to the point where it's in an internal PLA textbook or China's military. It declares that the battle for mind control happens on a smokeless battlefield and happens inside the domain of ideology. So it goes on to say, whoever controls this battlefield can win hearts. And then the document goes on to quote Xi Jinping in one of his secret speeches. And in that secret speech, he said, when it comes to combat in the ideology domain, we don't have any room for compromise or retreat. We must achieve total victory. If you really look at all these different leaders and in the way they look at art, it really is a tool to serve the state and their goals, which in the end is to achieve total hegemony. In the United States and in the free world, we've come to believe, you know, with World War I and World War II and all the movies and Vietnam and Korea and Iraq and Afghanistan, that you're either in war or you're not in war. And it involves uniforms, guns, planes, ships, and so on. That's the way we think in the United States, and we have to think very differently. There's something fantastic about these sheets of fire. People should want informed consent when it comes to a pharmaceutical pill that they put in to treat their body. They should have the same value attached to intellectual pills that they put into their brain. The Chinese Communist Party follow no rules. So their view is achieving military methods or military objectives through non-military means, okay? That means you. That means American people in your living rooms, in your schools, in your movie theaters, in your social media. That's what that means. Cultural clashes and power struggles between rival world powers, the U.S. and China. So now it's, it's everywhere. It's insidious. Uh, it is like a cancer. And it is going to be very difficult to defeat because it's, it's a brain disease. What we have to realize is the Chinese Communist Party is after control and they need to script a narrative to be something different than they are. They don't want anybody to know what they have really done or what their goal is. And that soft propaganda angle is where they feel they can infiltrate and make bigger gains, if you will. And we all know that their goal is global domination. By the time you get to the midpoint of this century, they intend for the 21st century to be the China century. President Xi Jinping is now surrounded by loyalists who, like him, believe that China's path to becoming a major power will have to come at the expense of American power and influence.
There was a moment in the kitchen, and I was on the phone with Marvel, talking to them about something that we wanted to do in the film that would placate the Chinese government. When I got off the phone, my wife said, it's crazy that you're just trying to please the Chinese government in that kind of a way. And I said, well, yeah, but it's important to the United States because if we do it, then we'll get access to that market, it'll create GDP growth and jobs and spreads aspirational quality of democracy. And she's like, I know, but it just feels like you're continuing to feed the beast. That was the moment where I thought to myself, oh my God, like, I was the NBA too. All these people that over the years have said, don't you feel like you're being a show for China? Don't you feel like you're being a little too heavy handed on things or trying to kowtow too much to the Chinese government? And I would say, no, 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 you don't understand. This is spreading aspirational quality of democracy in the country. This is about GDP growth and jobs here in the United States. Like, this is all good. You don't understand. You're saying that I'm doing something wrong, but I'm actually doing something right. You are wrong, I'm right. That was the moment where I said, oh my God, maybe I was in the wrong. It's a big mistake to give an authoritarian regime coercive power over your economy. The one big ally that Beijing has and is very powerful is the business lobby. China continue to change and evolve, and we are grateful at Apple. And the business lobby doesn't think about necessarily national security issues or principles, values. They just think about profit, loss, revenue, how to scale, what are the markets. And in a way that is supposed to be capitalism, but capitalism doesn't exist without the foundation of the countries that allow it to flourish, right? So. If you look at the business lobby, they're playing with fire. If they continue to push the envelope of unfettered access to China, do whatever it takes to get that, we're gonna lose what provides them the platform to even have that type of capitalism. From the perspective of the founding fathers, this First Amendment, freedom of religion, freedom of press, freedom of speech is essential. There's no real Hollywood in China. Everything's controlled. It's ridiculous for Hollywood not to stand up to an enemy of the democracy within which it has grown up and flourishes. Without those principles, there's no Hollywood. We're only now seeing a little bit of pushback to, uh, towards that. I mean, we saw with the latest Doctor Strange movie, we saw the uh, Epic Times newsstand was put in a couple of the different action scenes. We saw with Sony standing up to uh, the Chinese authorities who wanted to get the complete third act of Spider-Man changed so that there was no um, visual presence of the Statue of Liberty, which was ridiculous. The studio Sony said no. In general, we did. We fed the dragon for too long, and um, I thought that would make a great sort of title for the book. Even in my, my social media, I refer to myself as like feeding the dragon or the dragon feeder, mainly because I feel like I'm a bit on, not a crusade, but I, I, I want to be a part of the process of trying to fix this. And until it's fixed, I'm going to blame myself as being part of the feeding the dragon problem, so I'll continue calling myself the dragon feeder. It's a very powerful story that we had in our last movie, Finding Courage. It's really been very successful in film festivals. And so the fact that some film festivals censored that, we had a number of film, film festival directors call and say, we are so scared to show your movie. Some of them did it anyway, others didn't. Um, there was one festival that we're aware of that was receiving funding from, from China, advertising dollars, and we're talking tens of thousands every year. They decided, um, you know, when they take that money, there's criteria, you know, you don't show things that would offend your advertiser. 
being China, the CCP. But that year they decided, when our movie came out, they d didn't take the money and we won a prize. Uh, we, won, we won a top prize at that festival. It hit the audience that we were trying to reach. It made an impact to the point where it, it instigated the formation of an organization called uh, End Transplant Abuse in China. That organization went on to uh, gather support from um, professionals all across the world. An independent international tribunal concludes that China is killing prisoners in order to harvest their organs. The Chinese government says it's reformed the practice. But the China tribunal suggests it is still happening. Targeting prisoners because of their religious beliefs and then making a profit by trafficking these victims' organs. I can't. And so knowing that the work that, that I did contributed to that was very rewarding, more rewarding than any certificates or trophies or industry recognition because I knew that that is something I could really be proud of and that in the future my, my kids, my, my grandkids could say, you know, you knew what happened at that time when that horrific persecution was happening. What did you do about it? Well, I did something. We don't have a grievance with the Chinese people or the culture that I romantically had this, uh, this yearning to engage. So it sounds in this case, Red, it's like the Chinese people themselves are the biggest victims of the Chinese regime. Is that fair to say? Oh, they're the first victim and they're the largest victim. And it's really too sorrowful to think about what, what the Chinese people have suffered for generations now. And those stories need to be told. Think of the famine. Think of the Cultural Revolution. Think of what it was like to be brought out on a stage before everyone you went to school with, your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, your friends, and to be berated. Think what it would be like to be pregnant and to be forced to have an abortion. Think of how impotent you would feel as a husband or as a father or as a brother to watch this happen to your, your wife, your sister, your mother. These are sorrowful stories. I used to have an internship program in Hollywood for Chinese students. And I remember one day, one of my employees got sick and I had to take the big white van down to the airport to pick up the students from China as they landed. They had this long flight. I brought them to their living quarters where they were going to live. And the first thing one of the young women asked is if she could go to a bookstore. And I took her to the Barnes & Noble on the 3rd Street Promenade there in Santa Monica. And I, we lost her, we couldn't find her. We went to eat, it had been hours, and then well, where is she? And I went walking around the bookstore and I saw her sitting with a book on her lap. She had piles of books next to her, tears in her eyes, and she looked up at me. She was in the Asia Pacific section. She looked up and she said, the world knows more about us than we know about ourselves. And that was quite sorrowful. The world needs to know these stories, not from books, but from art, from film. And, you know, the world needs to know what this, this wicked ideology of evil has inflicted on the people of China for generations. Вот Борис Николаевич, мне сейчас, когда уже мы встретились... Here's the good news, that ideologies of evil Regimes based on ideologies of evil collapse because evil is a deprivation and it cannot sustain itself. So you saw Nazi Germany's thousand year Reich lasted not even 13 years. Soviet Union did last 70 years. I believe the CCP is coming to an end. I'm really looking forward to a free China. I'm really looking for a China where they can tell their stories. I'm looking for a, a Tibet that can breathe free. I'm looking for the Uyghurs who can breathe free. And it's coming, and then the stories will come. We should be using entrepreneurship, satire, 
film, entertainment, and programming to sow doubt, but also push truth into the China space in ways that its leaders won't be able to ignore, might upset and frustrate them, but they deserve that. And the people of China deserve it. I'm thankful, you know, thank God I'm still working in an industry that I still love. I love what I do and I'm gonna keep making movies and make movies that I wanna make that have a positive influence on people, not a negative. I think creativity and free expression is in our DNA. It's in the Constitution. It's what, we're, it's what we care so deeply about. And I think that Hollywood should be uh, the beacon of that, it should be the, the light that we all look to. But I would love Hollywood to embrace America again. There's a lot of difficulty in when you want to tell stories about China that the Chinese Communist Party doesn't like. And so that ties into the work we do at our media company, especially our show China in Focus. Because we focus on Communist China and exposing all of that. And so it's quite hard because it's hard to get sponsors. Many companies don't want to risk their China ties. Maybe they're supportive of what we do, but they want to. They don't want to risk any business ties they might have. The protests, if that's enough to take down GDP. And so that's one hard aspect. You know, can't pay your own salaries. But another big part is a lot of our reporters actually still have family in China. And so because of that, they don't go on camera because they don't want to endanger any family members they have back home. And so it's hard on them as well, you know, to progress that way. But despite all the difficulties in, say, reporting on what happens in China, there are moments that are really rewarding. So one was in the very beginning of our show, just when the pandemic started, we had a viewer who emailed us and was like, you know, I was in Wuhan visiting family. This was around the Lunar New Year. And they saw our coverage. And because of that, they got an earlier flight. And right after that, everything was shut down. And they're like, thank you for saving our life. Because if it wasn't for your coverage, we would have still been in Wuhan and maybe would have been still under lockdowns three years later. And stories like that just really was both encouraging and inspiring for us. And it's why we continue to do what we do, despite, say, all the difficulties. As you just saw, movies drive trends in society, from our politics to our culture. Please help us share this film and get the truth out there. Either scan this QR code or visit the website on screen right now to join in the effort and spread the word. We've also set up a way to pay it forward so others can learn about what's really happening for free. Every American needs to hear this story. Help us make it happen.